This is the twelfth in a series of thirteen lessons on the Holy Bible. I'm assuming that most of you who are viewing this at the present time have never read the whole Bible. You might have started several times. You got through the book of Genesis and through part of the book of Exodus, and then you began to get discouraged when you got involved with all the technical details in the, mosaic, in the law of Moses. Uh, what we've tried to do is to encourage you to read the Bible. It's not a book to be afraid of. It's a book which is alive and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. And it's like planting a seed. A little child can plant a seed by accident, and it will grow. And the Bible is like a seed. It is alive, and you plant it in your life, and it will grow, and it will produce something quite wonderful. Earlier in the series, we used this little puzzle. Some people have studied the Law of Moses, and some people have studied the Psalms, and some people have studied the various prophets. Others come along and say, well, we're going to study the Gospels, which is the heart of the Bible. Somebody else comes along and says, well, the book of Acts is the most important part. Somebody else says, no, the epistles are the most important thing. But we've tried to show you that the Bible is a book about love, and it all fits together like pieces of a puzzle. So it doesn't matter whether you're studying the first of the Bible and the books of law. The book of Genesis is a book about love. The Bible says, this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that you should love one another and not be like Cain. All the Bible is a book about love. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your soul and all of your strength is the most important commandment in all the Bible, and to love your neighbor as yourself is similar to it and likened to it. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. However, the message of Scripture should never be allowed to become something merely academic that you only talk about and only play mental games with. It's a very real book, and it deals with very real problems which you face in your life. At the risk of sounding blasphemous, let me say that God is to a certain degree an abstraction. The Greek word for worship is proskuneo, and strong in his exhaustive concordance says the definition of that word is like a dog bowing down or kneeling down before its master. I like that illustration because my father has always kept dogs, and he has one now which is particularly obedient. It always just crouches down because it loves my father so much and does exactly what my father wants it to do. It's a hunting dog. And there's a sense in which we bow ourselves before God. But a lower animal, like a dog, can only bow down before a master it can see. But we have the capacity to bow down and worship a God whom we have never seen. God's a spirit. No man hath seen God at any time. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 8, the Bible talks about a God whom having not seen you love, and though you don't see him now, yet rejoicing, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Helen Adams Keller was born in 1880. At the age of 18 months, she was stricken with a terrible illness which left her blind and deaf. And of course, a few months later, she ceased to speak because at the age of 18 months, she had only learned to babble a few words. And so she was blind and deaf and dumb. And she remained so throughout the remainder of her life. And yet she became a very highly educated woman, a college graduate. And her ability to speak has been described as one of the greatest educational achievements of mankind. When Helen Adams Keller wanted to hear Yasha Heifetz play on the violin, the only antenna she had to understand music was were, were her fingers. She'd just reach out her hand and place her hand on the violin while he played. Enrique Caruso sang for her, and the only way she had of appreciating his voice was to put her fingers upon his lips and her thumb upon his throat. I suppose there's a sense in which God is like that with reference to us. He is, a, in a sense, an abstraction. He's out there someplace or in here somewhere, and the only way we can know God is in a way difficult to describe. 
The Hebrews years used the word glory to describe the presence of God. They saw the fire descending on the tabernacle, and they used the word glory. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I do know that Hebrew word. It's kabod. It's easy for me to remember because when the glory of the Lord departed from Israel, a little child was born, and they called the child Ichabod, which means no glory. The word kabod literally means heavy. The root is found 370 some times in the Hebrew Bible, and a number of times it is literally translated. For example, Eli was heavy. He was the old high priest, and when the ark had been stolen by the Philistines and his sons Hophni and Phinehas were killed, someone came to bury him news. He was sitting upon a rock, and he fell off of that rock when he was shocked by that terrible news, and he broke his neck because the Bible says he was heavy. That's the word. Kabod. David's son Absalom pulled his hair every year, and the Bible says it was heavy. Kabod. So when the Hebrew people saw the glory of God descend upon the tabernacle, they used the word heavy. And in modern vernacular, our young people talk about something difficult to understand. They say, man, that's heavy. It's profound. It is weighty. When the Hebrews saw the presence of God manifest at the tabernacle, they didn't know how to explain. How would you go around the mountainside and explain that experience to someone who was not personally there? You couldn't. So you simply said, glory. Of course, at the present time in this dispensation, our bodies become temples of the Holy Spirit, which we have of God. And the scriptures command us to glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are the Lord's. There's something difficult to define about that. One way that God helped us to understand the word glory was by the institution of marriage. When the husband and wife become one in the marriage bond, the word used to describe that intimate relationship in the Hebrew language was the word no. So the Bible says Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore a son, and they called his name Cain. The Bible says also about Joseph and Mary. Joseph knew her not, did not become intimate with her until after she had given birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Now, we want you to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We want you to experience that glory. Now, I can't tell you about it in an adequate way. It's like the little boy trying to tell someone how sweet honey was. How sweet is it? And he kept trying to say, well, it's as sweet as, it's as sweet as, and ultimately he said what I'm going to say. You'll just have to taste it yourself. I would love to tell you how sweet it is to know the glory of the Lord, but that's an experience that I can only advise you to experience for yourself. Now, there are several things that you need to do if you want to have a right relationship with God. And the message of Scripture is going to be really irrelevant and meaningless to you until you know the Lord personally in your heart, until you have that intimate personal experience which the Scriptures call being born again. It's becoming so intimate with God that a new life is produced. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation the scriptures teach. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. When you plant a little seed in the ground at garden time, I don't know what makes it grow. I really can't understand that. A miracle happens. The seed seems to die. It seems to disappear, but there's a germ of life there that produces something profound and wonderful. And I don't profess to understand not even physical life and especially physical life, but there are a number of analogies that are uh, applicable. For example, the Bible is a seed. You plant that in your heart, and it's already been planted there. The precious Word of God has been planted in your heart and in your mind, and now it's starting to grow. And it's my prayer that it's going to produce faith, that you're going to believe that there is a God. It's not just enough to believe that there's a God. You must believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You have to believe that there's a reward, that God 
is going to somehow honor you and reward you because of your faith. That's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Two essential ingredients to faith. First of all, you must believe that God is. Secondly, you must believe that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But it's possible to believe in vain. The devils believe in tremble. They just don't do anything about it. You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart and mind and soul and strength. And when you love him, the Bible says, you'll keep his commandments. There's a passage over in 1 Corinthians 16, 22 that says, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. Now, there are five different Greek words for love, three of which occur in the scriptures. This particular word surprised me because it was not agapao, which is an intellectual type of love, but that word is phileo, which is a friendly type of love, that you have to be a friend of Jesus. You have to be attracted to Jesus. If any man is not attracted to Jesus, let him be anathema maranatha. If you are not attracted to the life of someone who cared about little children and lepers and paralyzed people and who went about doing good, my friend, you are beyond the pale of redemption. You must want to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, after you hear the word, after you believe the word, after you manifest your desire to do the will of Christ, the Bible calls that repentance and teaches that the times of ignorance God overlooked. There was a time when God winked at sin in a sense but not now. He commands all men everywhere to repent. That's found in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts when Paul was speaking to the Athenians on, Ma on Mars Hill. My friend, I don't know what you're doing that's wrong, but you better quit it. If you believe in God at all, if you want to have a right relationship with God at all, you better turn from that kind of sin. The Bible word for repentance literally means to change the mind. It's the Greek word metanoieo. It's a change of mind that results in a change of life. Then you better not be ashamed of him. I wouldn't want you to be ashamed of Jesus. He said to his disciples, if you deny me on earth, I will deny you before the Father which is in heaven. But if you confess me upon the earth, I will confess you before the Father which is in heaven. The Bible teaches that with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I don't understand all about that, but I believe it. And I think every time I confess Jesus Christ with my mouth, I am, in a sense, touching the eternal in a very beautiful way. Then the Bible teaches that you need to be baptized. Now, baptism in Bible times was done the same hour of the day or of the night when a person confessed his faith. The eighth chapter of the book of Acts talks about the Ethiopian eunuch. He stopped his chariot in the middle of a deserted area between Jerusalem and Gaza. He went down into the water and Philip the evangelist baptized him into Christ. Saul of Tarsus was baptized immediately upon his confession of faith in the city of Damascus. Ananias the preacher said, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The Philippian jailer was baptized at the midnight hour, at the very time when he confessed his faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not certain all the reasons for that, but I like to think that our conversion experience is so radical that it's like death to the old life and starting out a brand new life. And when that happens, something very significant occurs, not only in the heavens, but also in your heart. Let me share with you this article from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. The Roman Catholic Church in St. Louis is discovering or rediscovering the beautiful truth of baptism by immersion. The article is titled, Baptism by Immersion Catches On with Catholics here. And one of the priests has this to say about it. Baptism by immersion was the standard practice in the early churches. Many of them had pools with stairs leading down into the water. What we're discovering today is that involving the entire person in these rites has an impact. That was the secret of the early church. They didn't need a commentator to tell them that baptism was a symbol of dying in Christ 
and rising to new life, when they were stripped of their clothing and escorted into the water, they could feel it. So the Bible teaches we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Baptism is actually the only thing in the Christian life you do one time. You pray over and over, you repent over and over, you confess over and over, but there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, above all, and in you all. Let me appeal to you with the words of Scripture. If you have not yet done so, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, baptism is not the end of the Christian life. It's only the beginning. And from that beautiful baptismal experience, you arise to walk in a newness of life. Now, conversion is instantaneous, but transformation is a process. John, the beloved apostle, for example, was at one time called by Jesus a son of thunder because he had such a violent temper but in the latter part of his life, he is known as the Apostle of Love. And historians tell us that he died of natural causes in the city of Ephesus. And as an old man being carried to worship by the young men, he would say over and over and over unto them, My little children, love one another. What had happened to John, the beloved Apostle, can also happen to you. You can go through the process which the Bible calls transformation. The technical word for that in the Greek language is metamorphosis. We have the same word in it. Metamorpho actually is the Greek pronunciation. But it's, it's an English word which means to change from one form into another form. That can happen to you. You do not have to be characterized by the works of the flesh. The Bible says the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And then it lists all sorts of terrible things. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, hatred, enmity, variance, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, drunkenness, revelings, and things like that. We don't want your life to be characterized by works of the flesh, but rather by the fruit of the Spirit. When you receive Jesus Christ into your life, he begins the process of transforming you from the works of the flesh to the fruit of the Spirit so that now you can be known by love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and self-control. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. A poet one time said, It was battered and scarred, the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth the while to waste much time on that old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folks, he said, and who will start the bidding for me? One dollar or one? Two dollars two? Two dollars, who will make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice. Going, going, but no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. And wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loosened strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, like a caroling angel sings. Well, the auctioneer began again with a voice that was quiet and low. Now what am I bidding, good folks, he said, as he held it up with a bow. A thousand dollars? Who will make it two? Two thousand, and who will make it three? 3,000 once, 3,000 twice, going and gone, said he. Well, the people cheered, but some of them cried, we do not quite understand. What changed its worth? Came the quick reply. It was the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune, all battered and scarred by sin, is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A glass of wine, a game of cards, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going and almost gone. But the master comes 
and the careless crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. You need to know that master. He can change you from works of flesh to the fruit of the Spirit. Let me share with you a passage of Scripture found in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I want you to note how many, many times the word glory appears in this passage. Now remember, that's the word which indicates the transcendent power of God as far as our ability to know him. Glory is something heavy and profound and exceedingly wonderful. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning with verse 7. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I think Nathaniel Hawthorne knew the Lord, and he wrote a story which may very well have been intended to be a commentary upon this passage of Scripture. I want to tell you that story. It's the story of the great stone face. The story goes like this, that high up in the white hills of New Hampshire, there was carved out by nature on the perpendicular side of a mountain the likeness of a stone face, a tremendous face. Now, if you got too close, you couldn't see it. All you could see would be ponderous and gigantic stones heaped in chaotic ruin, one upon another. But if you would withdraw your steps, get far enough away, the great stone face seemed positively to be alive. And when the thunder would reverberate throughout the valley, the great stone face seemed to be speaking. In the shadow of that mountain, a little boy was born whose name was Ernest. And his mother each evening would hold him and tell him stories about the great stone face. You see, the Indians in the valley had a legend that someday a man would come to the valley who looked exactly like the face on the mountainside. Ernest, as a toddling little child, would clap his hands in childish delight dreaming of the day when he would see the man his mother had always talked about. When Ernest was a teenage boy, everybody said the man was on his way. This particular man had been born in the valley, and he had gone out to make his fortune, and he was now the richest man in the world. Camels and caravans brought him wealth from all over the world, and he was retiring now and returning to the valley of his birth, and those who knew him well said he looked like the great stone face to a hare. So the multitudes were lining the pathway as the man's carriage came down the roadway. Ernest was there too, standing on tiptoe and looking over a sea of upturned faces. But Ernest went away sad. He said, well, he looks a little bit like the man on the mountainside, but the resemblance is only shallow and superficial. As the months went by, the people came to agree with Ernest that the man was far too stingy, far too selfish, to be the representative which they had prayed to and dreamed about all those years. Well, this is the stage that is set over and over again in Nathaniel Hawthorne's story. 
The next time someone came, it was a, a very famous general, the decorated and battle-scarred veteran of many foreign wars. They had a picnic for him out in the woods, and everybody said, well, this guy looks just like the great stone face. Ernest went away sad. He says, no, he doesn't. There's a shallow superficial resemblance, but that's not the man. Next time it was a great poet or a philanthropist. And one by one the people paraded themselves before the public. Each time Ernest saw through their shallowness and superficiality. Ernest each evening as his mother had taught him would stand and pray as he looked toward the mountain. As he dreamed of the kind and benevolent qualities which he saw in the great stone face. He was old, his back was bent, his hair was gray and he would die if the man did not soon appear. Well, the people who lived in that area would come and ask Ernest questions at even time. They knew always where to find him. And it became his habit to step up to a little uh, plateau, a raised area, where there was just enough room for a man to make whatever gestures would normally accompany genuine thought and earnest emotion. The gray rock was relieved by a beautiful tapestry of green foliage, and the people standing down below Ernest would ask him all sorts of questions and he would give his answers. And on this particular occasion, as Ernest was answering the questions of the public, his face was imbued with a grandeur of expression which seemed to embrace the world. His hair was white, the wind was blowing, and the people down below him looked at his face and then they looked behind him at the great stone face on the mountain with the white clouds swirling about it, and they threw up their hands by an irresistible impulse and said, Ernest is himself the image of the great stone face. I would like to quote again from 2 Corinthians 3.18, and I want you to see the beautiful parallel between this passage of Scripture and Nathaniel Hawthorne's story. We all with an unveiled face Behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. And while we do that, we're going through a metamorphosis. We are being transformed into the image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. And all of this happens by the Holy Spirit. God bless you. 